In the mid-1950s, a Soviet spy, codenamed Victor, pulled off an incredible feat. He utilized a pencil and paper cipher that not even the FBI was able to crack. This cipher was known as the VIC cipher. It was discovered on a piece of microfilm inside a hollowed-out five-cent coin by a newspaper boy in 1953. Considered to be part of the nihilist family of ciphers, the VIC cipher was not cracked until the Soviet spy who used it defected in 1957 and explained its inner workings to the NSA. Up until that point, the cipher successfully resisted all attempts of cryptanalysis done by the NSA. This cipher included several important components within it, most notably mod 10 additions, left Fibonacci generation or chain addition, a straddling checkerboard, columnar transposition, and more. So let's take a look at how it actually worked. The secret key used for encryption included four elements, a date in a six-digit format, a 20-letter key phrase, usually the first line of a song, a five-digit number called a random indicator group, and the agent's personal number usually a one or a two digit number. In our example, we're gonna use June 4th, 1886 as our date, I dream of genie with T as our key phrase, 88651 as our random indicator group, and 13 as our agent's personal number. These four elements are going to help us create the straddling checkerboard that we're going to use for encryption. We're going to start off by subtracting the first five digits of the date from the indicator group using modular arithmetic. That is to say that first we're going to do digit by digit subtraction. So subtracting 8 from a 1 would be a negative 7, 8 from 5 a negative 3, 1 from 6 a 5, and so on. Then we perform a mod 10 operation on each of the following digits and we end up with the following sequence. Next, we divide our 20 letter phrase into two 10 letter halves. We're going to assign each letter a number from 1 to 10 according to its order of appearance in the alphabet. Note that we're going to represent the 10th digit by a 0 in order to avoid two-digit representations. Taking the first half on the left, A is our first letter, so we'll represent it with a 1. D is the second, this first E on the left is the third, and the second one we encounter right here would be our fourth, and so on. Notice that we represented R, which in this phrase is the last letter in the alphabet by order, with a 0 instead of a 10. Then we repeat the same process on the second half. The next step is to expand the 5-digit number we got from the previous modular arithmetic subtraction into 10 digits using left Fibonacci generation, also known as chain addition. Starting with a group of 5 digits, we add the first two digits, apply a mod 10 operation on the answer, and append it to the right. Adding 4 to 5 is 9, 9 modulo 10 is also 9, and we append that to the right. We repeat this process until we end up with 10 digits in total. After that, we're going to perform digit-by-digit digit addition of the 10-digit number we just produced and the encoding of the first half of our key phrase, while also using modular arithmetic. So after adding up each two digits, we perform a mod 10 operation and end up with the following sequence. To encode the sequence we just produced, we're going to use the second half of the key phrase. What we're gonna do is that we're gonna encode its first digit as 1, the second digit as 2, up until the 10th, which we'll encode as 0. Using the mapping we just created, we can now encode our sequence. To encode our first digit 8, we check its mapping, which is also an 8. Next, to encode the second digit 6, we check its mapping, which is a 0, and so on. The penultimate step to reaching our straddling checkerboard is to generate 50 pseudo-random digits through lacked Fibonacci generation. We're going to use the sequence we just produced for that. As mentioned before, to achieve that, we add the first two digits, apply a mod 10 operation on the answer, and append that to the right. We're going to repeat this process till we generate 50 new pseudo-random digits. We're going to use this last row of 10 digits in our final step, which is sequencing. That is to say that we're going to encode the sequence from 1 to 10 while taking into consideration the order of appearance. 
Our first number is 1. After that, we have two twos, so I'll order them by appearance, and so on. This final sequence of numbers represents the top row of numbers of our straddling checkerboard. The second row represents the eight most frequent letters of English. We are going to use the English mnemonic at one sir to capture those letters, while making sure to include the spaces. The third and fourth row are filled with the rest of the alphabet in order, as well as with any special characters that might be used in a message, which usually are a period and a slash. The indices of the third and fourth row are going to be three and four, since these are the indices not used for row two. Thus, row two letters can be referred to by one index, which is the number of the column, and row three and row four letters can be referred to by two indices, one for the row and one for the column. With the straddling checkerboard in place, we can begin enciphering a message. Assume that the message is, Vic, you will be sent some money before dawn. In this case, V corresponds to 49, I corresponds to only 8 since it's in the second row, C to 37, and so on. From the last row of the 50 pseudo-random digits we generated before, we can determine the last two unequal digits, which are 3 and 0. We add the agent's personal number to each of these digits to determine the width of the two columnar transpositions used to transpose the sequence of numbers we just obtained. To determine the keys of these two transpositions, we read out the 50 pseudo-random digits by column, using the 10 digits we produce them with as a transposition key. We start off with this column that has the smallest index, which is 2. We read out its digits, which are 1, 4, 5, 6, 2. Next is this column of index 4. We read out its digits. Then we go to the other column of index 4, and so on, till we end up with 34 digits, which is the addition of 21 and 13. The first 21 digits of this sequence represent the key of the simple columnar transposition, and the next 13 digits are the key of the irregular columnar transposition. We fill out the table of the first transposition with the sequence we got from using the straddling checkerboard. As we did in the previous step, we read out the digits in each column in order using the key. Here we have three columns with index 1, so we go in order of appearance, then we read out the digits in this column of index 2, and so on, till we read out all digits in all columns. As always, column 0 is the last one we read out, since 0 represents a 10 in our process. We're going to use this sequence in our second and final transposition, which is an irregular columnar transposition. The key, as mentioned before, is the last 13 digits of our initial sequence. Although this transposition is also a columnar transposition, it includes an extra layer of complexity. So it is necessary for us to lay out the structure of the table before proceeding. The key is not only going to indicate the order with which we read out the columns, but also how we're going to fill out these numbers in the table. First, we specify a triangular area that starts at the top of the column, which we will be reading out first. In our case, that's two and then it extends to the end of the row. In the following row, we start off with one column later, and so on, until we reach the last column in our rows. We can determine the number of rows we need by simply dividing the number of digits in our sequence, which is 50, by the length of our key, which is 13, and taking the ceiling of that, so we end up with four rows. Now, we have successfully split our table into two zones and we're going to fill out the triangular one first with the sequence we got from the earlier transposition. When we finish filling out this zone, we fill out the one next to it, and we're ready to read out the columns in order, as we were doing before, starting off with, of course, the first column with index 2. So finally, we have reached the following encrypted message, or our ciphertext. This has been a thorough explanation of the VIC cipher, which is considered to be one of the strongest pen and paper ciphers actually used in the real world. However, with modern computing, it is no longer considered to be a strong cipher and can actually be cracked using brute force attack within less than a day.